Okay. Uh, afternoon, friends. We're back on our studies on the book of Daniel and Revelation. Our last study, we examined the fourth trumpet of Revelation chapter 8. And we looked at this prophecy where it was a prophecy about the dark ages. God depicted it in, in graphic detail. The devil had the power to darken part of the sun, part of the moon, and part of the stars. And when we were studying these, we saw that they were prophetic symbols for the sun was the ministry of Jesus, uh, not only salvation, but also that ministry in heaven's sanctuary on our behalf. The Bible the, was the moon, the reflected light of the glory of Christ. And uh, the stars are those who proclaim God's word. They're guiding lights, just like Polaris, the North Star, guided many people home. Um, their homes were north. He, Polaris was a fixed point. It was a guide. And people who share the word of God with others are guides that point to the great light, to the sun, to Christ. Um, as part of our study, we also realized that the, uh, the papacy, um, the devil using the papacy during this time, he wanted the light to be put out. He killed those. He trampled on the stars, those who would share God's word with others. They also took the moon, the Bible, away from people. They chained it to monastery walls. The only copies people could see were in Latin, and most of the people couldn't read that language. And that's why God raised up the monks and the priests and the pastors, those who could read the Latin, who had access to the scriptures, the Martin Luthers and the, the Calvins and the, the Wycliffs to share the word that had been hidden. Um, so today we're going back into the book of Daniel. We're, we're going to examine a prophecy. Last time I talked about how um, we were going to uh, We've been talking with you about this throughout the studies that we were going to get to a point where we were going to talk about the formation of the papacy, how this army that it received to attack God's people with that, that it was prophesied that it would have, how that came about. Also, how it destroyed those three kingdoms, the uh, the Heriali, the Vandals, and the Ostrogoths that stood in the way. Um, and then we'll, we'll talk a little bit about how those show us about when that the chains come off again, how the it receives the power, the deadly wound is healed, um, how looking at history, uh, we can see how that will happen again. Um, so our study today is the 1290 years of Daniel chapter 12. So as we dive into Daniel 12, we're going to find that it's a fascinating chapter that begins with the time of trouble at the end of the world. The first three verses do. And following this vision, uh, jo Daniel sees Jesus talking to two angels about events that would take place shortly before the end. Um, in particular, we're going to look at the fact that the abomination of desolation would reign for 1290 prophetic days during which it would turn the minds of the people from what Jesus was doing for them in heaven. It would keep those minds on earth. Um, the devil didn't want people to know that. So let's get into our our study today. Um, so our study, the verses we're going to primarily be studying are Daniel chapter 12, verses 4 through 11, and verse 13. So the other verses, chapter 12, verse 12, and verses 1 through 3, we'll cover in, in later studies. Um, so let's start with Daniel chapter 12, verse 10. Oftentimes, people want, want to know, why uh, why Bible prophecy cannot be understood by, by many people? Well, the Daniel 12.10 gives us a principle. It says, many will purify themselves and be made white and be refined, but the lawless will act lawlessly and none of the lawless shall understand, but those who are wise shall understand. So in this verse, the Bible says that the lawless will not understand the prophecies, but that the wise, those who are led by God, they'll understand. So the question is, why is it that so many people misunderstand the prophecies 
of Daniel and Revelation. Um, and it's because these things have to be spiritually discerned. And uh, mom's going to read you a Bible text in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 14 through 16. There's this principle that we need to understand. But the natural man does not receive the things of the spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. But he who is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is rightly judged by no one. So you have to have the Holy Spirit. That's why we constantly ask God for the presence of the Holy Spirit before we have one of these studies, because in order to understand these prophecies, not just the prophecies, but the entire Bible, um, you need the same mind that inspired uh, the apostles, that inspired Paul, that inspired Moses, that inspired all those who wrote the Bible. Uh, and, and that's really fantastic, because if you imagine that for a moment. Um, what it would be like to uh, to say, man, I would have liked to have speak to William Shakespeare or so, another author and know what they were thinking when they wrote this particular passage. Uh, but you can do that when you ask for the presence of the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit inspired the Bible. So without the Holy Spirit, there's no understanding of the Bible. Another verse that helps us understand this is 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 20 through 21. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation, for prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So it's our prayer that as we have these studies that you'll understand them and that you will also teach others you know and you need both of the holy spirit um, those are two distinct functions of the holy spirit is to guide to understand and then to teach so you that's why we give the materials the powerpoints the scriptures the study guides so that you will in turn teach these to other people i mean get these things out share it let the light go out and shine to everyone friends like we said as we closed last time we have to work in the day right now because soon the time of darkness is coming so if we don't work in the day now, we'll have to finish in the times of darkness. So we need to share this with as many people as we can now. Second uh, Peter chapter one, verses 20 and 21, uh, a lot of people are accused of making things up. And people who are not led by the Holy Spirit, they'll make things up. You, you'll hear things in scripture sometimes where, well, this points to that and this means that. Um, you know, I remember one time somebody shared with me that they thought that in the book of Revelation, they quoted a particular verse and it said that uh, Philadelphia would be blown up in a certain year. Well, the problem with that is there was nothing in there about Philadelphia. None of the symbols, as you study scripture, the Bible tells you what the symbols represent. None of those symbols represented that at all. So they had taken and twisted a passage of scripture uh, and basically made something up. In order to understand the Bible, um, it, we have to understand it through earnest prayer, humbling of self, intense Bible study, uh, and then being led by God and by his spirit. That's how we'll understand what God wants us to in these great prophetic books. So God only is looking for hearts that he can teach. You know, it doesn't matter if you're, you know, uh, if you've been to the seminary or not, if God is speaking to you, you can teach others after as God teaches you. So now that we understand this principle, let's go back to John Daniel's vision of Jesus beginning in Daniel chapter 12, verse five. Then I, Daniel, looked and there stood two others, one on this riverbank and the other on that riverbank. And one said to the man clothed in linen who was above the waters of the river, how long 
shall the fulfillment of these wonders be? Then I heard the man clothed in linen who was above the waters of the river when he held up his right hand and his left hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever that it shall be for a time, times, and half a time. And when the power of the holy people has been completely shattered, all these things shall be finished. Okay, so Daniel saw the man clothed in linen. He saw him speaking to two angels about what the prophet had just seen in vision. Now, this man clothed in linen, we've seen in our studies before. When we studied Daniel chapter 10, this man clothed in linen popped up. He was dressed in high priestly garments, just as he is here. And the Bible tells us his name was Michael. Now, who's Michael? Well, if you haven't been with us, I want to invite you to, to study uh, Daniel chapter 10, because we had quite a, quite a study about who Michael was. But basically, we determined, based on, our, based on what the Bible says, the clues there, that Michael is another name for Jesus. So Daniel is seeing the Lord Jesus in vision. One of the angels asked Jesus how long it would be until the end of these wonders. Now, one thing the angel is not asking is how long until the end of the world, because the angel knew that only God the Father knows when the world would end. The angel is asking Jesus about the power of the papacy to fight against God and his people. So in response, Jesus held up both hands, and he swore by God that it would be for a time, times, and the dividing of time. So we've seen this particular phrase uh, before in scripture, and there's a lot of confusion on this. There's actually two schools of thought on what this particular passage in Daniel 12, 7 means. So in order for us to understand it, let's read it again. Uh, Daniel chapter 12, verse 7, he said, And I heard the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, when he held up his right hand and his left hand unto heaven, and swear by him that lives forever, that it shall be for a time, times, and a half. And when he shall have accomplished to scatter the power of the holy people, all these things shall be finished. It actually, in the original language, says they, he would scatter the power of the holy people to the four winds. It would scatter it um, in every direction. So G, in, notice that Jesus does not refer to the future rise of the papacy at the end of time. Instead, Jesus, in speaking about future events, he's taking us back to the historical rise of the papacy in 538 AD. And that's the problem a lot of people have is that they want to jump forward, but they do not look at the past. You see, when you look at scripture, the Bible tells us there's nothing new under the sun. So what has happened in the past will happen again in the future. So in order to understand how the future rise of the papacy will take place, we need to look at how it happened in the past. All right. Jesus here is talking about historical events, not future events. And this is extremely important for us to understand as we examine the rest of our prophecy today. So there are two different events, two different views, I should say, on this time period, as well as the 1290 days and the 1335 days that are mentioned later in the chapter. Okay, so the, in order to understand those two periods of time, we have to understand a few facts about this period of time. Now, the two views hinge. One view says the 1260 days here, time, times, and half a time, are literal days. The other view states that they are prophetic days, that it's a prophetic period of time that marks AD 538 to AD 1798, the power of the papal supremacy, the time period that the papacy ruled. Well, I want to tell you from studying scripture, this is the view that God is giving us. This is the, he's referring us back to the 1260 years. Uh, those who hold 
that the 12 these days are literal say that they refer to the future revival of power by the papacy at the end of time. These days, they, they say, cannot be prophetic. They have to be literal. And the other two periods, uh, they say, point to the close of probation and the second coming of Christ. So they believe the 1335, at the end of that time, is the second coming of Christ. Well, let me share with you why this view where that these days are literal and not prophetic, and that uh, is in error. And there's three main reasons. First, Jesus himself declared that only the Father knew the time of Christ's return. And we find that in Matthew chapter 24, verse 36. But of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my father only. Okay, so God himself is the only one who knows the day and hour Christ is coming. That means that God is not going to reveal that in any place in scripture, okay? So if you could point to that event and say, well, we know that period began this period of time, so that amount of days later, Jesus is going to come, that would be saying that Jesus was a liar and that Jesus was tell what Jesus told people was not the truth. Okay. Uh, that's a dangerous position to get in because to say Jesus was wrong, but I'm right because I found this period of time. That's a dangerous position to get in. We're going to find that did not, those years do not point to the second coming of Christ. So the second reason that those could not be literal, but instead are prophetic days, uh, is that there is no indication in scripture as to how long exactly that the crisis at the end of time will be. Okay, we're given an idea of whether it's a long period or a short period, but the Bible doesn't spell out for us how many years, how many months the crisis at the end of time will be. It does tell us it's very intense, but short in duration. And we find this in Matthew chapter 24, verse 22. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. So it'll be a very short, intense period of time. But Jesus doesn't give us a time prophecy as to how long they are. And, the, and third, the Bible mentions this same period of time seven times. This is just one of the seven times. You see, this period of time is mentioned seven times in the Bible. It's mentioned in Daniel 7.25, here in Revelation 12.7. It's mentioned in Revelation 11.2, Revelation 11.3, Revelation 12.6, Revelation 12, 14, and Revelation 13, verse 5. In the same time period, always refers to this that you see on the screen, those 1260 years of papal supremacy. It's always prophetic time, not literal days. So what that would mean is that the uh, 1290 days would also be prophetic days, as would be the 1335. Okay, according to the prophecy, during this period of time, this 1260 years, the papacy would scatter the power of the people of God to the four winds. It would completely uh, destroy any power that they had. And, and when we get into Revelation chapter 12, I'll show you how this is parallel to what this says here, that the, the church that was not the papacy would run into the wilderness, a place of solitude and refuge. It would not be a united church. Instead, little groups would be scattered all over the place, just as the Bible stated. So now that we understand that Jesus is, was speaking about the historical power of the papacy to destroy the people of God, let's look at this unique phrase that appears in the book of Daniel. This actually appears in the book of Daniel seven times. And the phrase is the time of the end. Okay. 
Now notice that this phrase is the time of the end and not the end of time. There's a distinction here and we need to understand this. The time of the end and the end of time are two distinct periods of time, okay? So the time of the end, or you could say the beginning or the preparation of the end begins with an interesting event. So we need to understand when the time of the end began. And this event is here in Daniel 1140. And it's marked by an attack from the king of the south against the king of the north. And we discovered in our study on Daniel 11 a, a while back that the king of the north at that time was the papacy. The final one, the final power to hold that title king of the north is the papacy. Remember, as we studied, we saw it was Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, the Roman Empire, and then later the papacy. And when the king of the south attacks him, uh, th he's attacking the papacy. Now, in a few studies, we're going to look at this attack because we're going to see it in the book of Revelation. We're going to identify for you who the king of the south is, okay? So the Bible says, at the time of the end, shall the king of the south push at him, and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind with chariots and with horsemen and with many ships, and he shall enter into the countries and he shall overflow and pass over. Okay, so this phrase um, push is actually um, the a more accurate translation of the original word is to gore or to mortally wound. Every time you and where you get this is if you look up in your concordance, look up the word push, you'll find that it's an ox pushing against somebody with his horns, uh, or a ram, in the, a goat in a ram, in this case, in the prophecy of Daniel chapter 8, where the ram, the ram is pushed against by the goat. It's not a gentle push like this. No, it's the, the ram runs into the goat full of strength in his power, and he gores him or mortally wounds him. So the papacy, the king of the north, was to be mortally wounded by the king of the south. And this event marked the beginning of the time of the end, okay? And uh, so what year, what year did this take place? Well, according to history, the papacy was mortally wounded. The deadly wound took place in 1798. The French government sent General Alexander Berthier into Rome. Berthier took the Pope prisoner, abolished the papal government, and established a sec secular government. But this is the deadly wound, guys. Not the Pope being taken prisoner. The deadly wound where the chains go back on the papacy is that starting with France the United States and all the other nations of the world, they refused from that time on to aid the papacy in its war against God and his people. They said, you no longer use our armies. We People will be free to uh, worship God according to the dictates of their own conscience. You will not use our army in your war against God and his people. That's the mortal wound. And from that time on, they have not had that power again. So that deadly wound, that mortal wound is not healed. The Bible tells us the power of the papacy to persecute the saints was restrained. This marked the beginning of the time of the end, 1798, same year. That's when the time of the end starts. And I'm going to mention that several times throughout our study today, because I want you to get that uh, down on, on your timeline, um, 1798, the papacy is wounded, it's chained, goes into captivity, the, the ability to use the armies of other nations to persecute the people of God is gone, okay? 
but there are other events that would take place at this time. So this marks the time of the end. So Daniel chapter 12, verse 4, but you, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book even until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro and knowledge shall be increased. Okay, so we know that at the time of the end, knowledge, not only of the prophecies would be increased, but also scientific knowledge. This is not surprising as when you look at the Roman Empire, okay, the world advanced technologically to the point that the world, the Roman Empire had running water, okay, they had steam, they had heat, um, and there's even evidence that they could cool the water to the point that pe people could chop ice and have ice in their drinks, okay? Their medical knowledge was very advanced. They didn't have everything we have. They didn't have microscopes. Um, so they didn't know about germs and bacteria and things like that. But as far as quarantine, as far as being able to treat disease and disorders, I mean, there's even evidence that they did brain surgery in the Roman Empire. Okay, friends, they were very advanced. But when the, and they shared this knowledge with other nations, like places in the Arabian Peninsula, and some of the other areas in Asia, that people had this knowledge. But when the papacy took control of Europe, because many of these people that practiced this had practiced pagan religions, they outlawed the, this, the medical knowledge, the scientific knowledge, because they wanted to control the lives of the people. So in Europe, in quote unquote Christian Europe, the people were reduced to kind of a primitive state, all right? In other areas of the world, they knew, still knew this. But, um, and then you have, for example, you have scientists in the, in the dark ages, people like Galileo, they discovered that the earth orbited the sun. Well, that ran contrary to the papal idea that the earth stood still and everything revolved around the earth, including the sun. So Galileo, when he published this teaching, he was called, they brought in to answer for his quote unquote heresy. And so uh, they gave Galileo a choice, you know, you recant or else. Well, friends, Galileo was right. And we've discovered that. So, but Galileo decided he wanted to save his own skin and other people did too. But see, isn't that unfortunate that the church, if you will, retarded the progress the scientific progress. They also retarded the ability of people to study the scriptures, okay? So once the power of the papacy had been restrained, scientific knowledge poured out like a mighty river. And this also happened, Daniel 12, 9. He said, go your way, Daniel, for the words are shut up and sealed till the time of the end. So while it's true that we've seen scientific advances, um, Daniel chapter 12, verse 4 and 12, verse 9 are really about the increase of biblical knowledge. See, Daniel was a sealed, hard to understand book until the wounding of the papacy in AD 1798. See, up until this point, the prophecies were not understood much beyond chapter 7. When they looked at chapter seven, they realized, hey, this is talking about the papacy. And they understood when the 1260 years began. So the people watched that. And when it took place, they, they realized, wow, there's more to Daniel than, than we, when we, we understood. So let's study more. And so the seal, if you will, came off the book. People started pouring over the knowledge of the prophecies. So Daniel himself, he's not understanding um, how his prophecies would end. He, he wants to know clarification about the end. So this is what Daniel said in Daniel 12, 8. Although I heard, I did not understand. Then I said, my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? Okay, so God doesn't give Daniel a complete understanding of it. And in Daniel 12, 13, he shares with Daniel how important his book would be at the end of time, in the time of the, especially in the time of the end, but 
later on in the at the end of time as well daniel 12 13 he tells daniel but go your way till the end be for you shall rest and stand in your lot at the end of the days so daniel was told first that he would rest that's a reference to his death imagine god telling you that well you're gonna rest you're gonna die but you're going to stand in your lot at the end of the days. This is where the people who think this is literal get this wrong. They think that the word lot means the inheritance where the saints will inherit the earth. Okay, it comes from the Hebrew word gevel, and that means inheritance. But that does not imply that Daniel inherited his heavenly home because the 1335 years that are the end of the prophecy, they actually were fulfilled shortly after 1798. I want you to tuck that behind one ear because in three studies, we're going to cover that period of time, okay? But we have to cover a few things before that. So Daniel chapter 12 ended a long time ago, the time prophecies. Instead, what, what Daniel's lot is, is Daniel is being studied by this special group of people who study the book of, of Daniel and Revelation once these 1335 years end. And Daniel's writings were appreciated, and, and he rose to prominence as never before. You see this movement, the Advent movement, they proclaim the three angels' message. And the three angels' messages are the full proclamation of the book of Daniel. Okay, so the prophet stood in his lot. The people of God inherited all that knowledge that Daniel had been given. And so Daniel's place, he came into his own, his, his place, um, he has been appreciated. His writings have been appreciated as never before. Now, don't, don't um, get this wrong. There will come a time when Daniel, just like many other people, will be resurrected and he will re receive an inheritance among the saints of God. But that's not what this verse is referring to. So let's go back to our topic, and I want to share with you our main topic today, and that's the 1290 years, okay? So Daniel chapter 12, verse 11, and it refers to another event, okay? We know the 1260 years, but the 1290 years do not start at the same time, okay? It says, and from the time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away and the abomination that make it desolate set up, there shall be a thousand two hundred and ninety days. So we need to look at a time when the daily sacrifice is a supplied word, when the daily was taken away. In our study on Daniel chapter eight, a long time ago, we realized that the daily pointed forward to the daily ministration of the priest in the holy place of the sanctuary. And that pointed to Jesus' work in heaven's sanctuary. So we're looking for a time that whatever the abomination of desolation is, that it would take that or obscure that so that the people of God could not if you will, take advantage of that. If they couldn't, they couldn't make use of what Jesus was doing in heaven for them. So first we need to look at what is the abomination that makes desolate? Okay, what does this represent? Well, what is abomination in the eyes of the Lord? Okay, what does God call abomination? We find that in Proverbs 6, verses 16 through 19. These six things the Lord hates. Yes, seven are an abomination to him. A proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that are swift in running to evil, a false witness who speaks lies, and one who sows discord among the brethren. Okay, when you look at the prophecies about the papacy in Daniel chapter 7, Daniel chapter 8, 
11, Revelation 13, and Revelation 17. These are the characteristics of the papacy, friends. It's a bloodthirsty, arrogant system that placed idolatrous worship in the place of God, and it destroyed the people of God. It was proud, arrogant, had the nerve to think that it could change the laws of God, and the people that did not go along with that, it destroyed them, okay? So one thing about the, that is what the papacy is, the abomination that makes desolate. How does it make desolate? It makes desolate two things. It makes desolate spiritual life. It takes spiritual life away, which you'd not be surprised as a representative of Satan who takes life from God's people. Next, it actually takes the life of God's people. And that's a well-documented fact of history. 50 to 150 million people lost their lives because they would not bow down to this well, the claims of this system. They, it used titles like witches and all and heretic and all of that. But the, it was the same thing. They viewed them as a political and a religious threat. Okay. Now, what is the papacy? It is a union of church and state. It gets its power from the nations of Europe, along with other nations of the world. And without that state power, it would be a church that does not have an army to enforce its dogmas. Okay, that's what the papacy was throughout time. That's what the deadly wound took away from it. It doesn't have that state power to enforce its dogmas. Yes, Vatican City is a state church and a state. The Vatican City can't send out its armies to attack uh, the people of God worldwide. That power has been restrained, okay? But throughout the Dark Ages, that's what it did. It influenced people. You'll see that when you look at the history of Europe, okay? So Constantine was the first to establish this union of church and state. He threw his support behind the church, and a marriage, if you will, took place between the church and the state. And this union was broken a little over 100 years later when the Heruli abolished the Roman government in 476 AD. So now you just had a church without a state, without state power. In order to find fulfillment in our prophecy, we need to look for a government power that united with the papacy for 1290 years. Okay, so on the screen, you have a picture of Clovis, the Frankish king, King Clovis the first. So this is the man we're going to study, we're going to look at. Before we can understand the role that he was to play in the history of Europe and the fulfillment of Bible prophecy, we need to look at the history of the Franks and Clovis himself. So the Franks were a tribe of people who lived on the Rhine River in Western Germany. And they tried several times during the history of the Roman Empire to cross the Rhine River and settle permanently in Roman territory, but they were defeated each time by the Romans. But in the mid fourth century AD, as there were more barbarian incursions happening, the Franks were finally able to conquer part of Northern Belgium. And they crossed the river, they settled in Northern Belgium. Okay, and they settled there for, for a time Around 406 AD, another tribe, the Vandals, they launched an all-out invasive war on the Roman Empire that required many men, many resources to repel them. While that was going on, the Franks took advantage of that, the fact that the borders were not being garrisoned the way it should be, and they overcame the defenses, and they took advantage of this. They conquered the southern part of what is now Belgium and then northeastern France. So by the year 480 AD, the Franks had established themselves in the region, but they were always looking to expand. A little about them 
They were a divided people of several tribes that each possessed territory. They had their own king. They were, there were several different languages. Uh, there was several different Germanic languages, one of which was Celiac or Salian, uh, and that was the most prominent. There were actually two different uh, divisions among that particular group as well as several others. In 482 AD, Clo this man, Clovis I, became king of one of these Celiac tribes. And the first thing he did, and if you look at centuries later, this is what Genghis Khan in Mongolia did. He actually set out first to unify the tribes of the Mongols. Well, Clovis set out to unify the Franks, and he was successful. Um, and then he led a Frankish, united Frankish tribe um, to take over what is now northern and the rest of northern and then down into central France. And they accomplished this by the year 494 AD. Around the same time, Clovis was looking at, there was another kingdom, the Burgundians, that were to the southeast. And he needed to make an ally of these people. So he married the daughter of the Burgundian king. Her name was Clotilde. And she was a devout Roman Catholic. But Clovis was opposed to conversion. No matter what she would try, he was going to remain a pagan. But then comes the year 496 AD, and the Alamanni have invaded Clovis's territory, and he's in the middle of a, a losing battle. And they're invading his territory, and uh, the Franks are getting beat. And he's prayed to his pagan gods, and it's not working, and it it comes to mind, well, let me pray to the Christian God of my wife and let's see what happens. So he prays to Christ and he says, if you help me win the battle and then defeat my enemies, I will become a Christian. So the battle turns in Clovis's favor and they, whip the, and they defeat the Alamanni and they secure their borders. And Clovis didn't forget his promise and he's baptized into the Catholic faith on Christmas Day 496 AD. But even though Clovis converted, he didn't require all of his people to do so. And many of the Franks remained pagan. Well, in the meantime, Clovis is, is still seeking to expand his borders, and he engages in a war with the Visigoths, who by this time had taken over Spain and southern France. And he wins a series of victories against them in southern France and northern Spain. And the Catholic bishops then decide, well, now we need this guy to be defender of the faith. There's Aryan tribes in, here in, in Europe, and we need to conquer those. We need to make Catholic Christianity dominant in Europe. So when we look at the prophecy, okay, we need to look at what he did in 508. He he um, gave his country and his army to the service of the papacy, okay? This is what Daniel 8, um, 11 and 12, and we're going to read several other passages, talk about how the papacy would receive an army. He even exalted himself as high as the prince of the hosts, and by him, the daily sacrifices were taken away and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. Because of transgression, an army was given over to the horn to oppose the daily and he, was ca and he cast truth down to the ground. He did all this and prospered. Let's look at Ele Daniel 11 verse 31. And forces shall be mustered by him and they shall defile the sanctuary fortress then they shall take away the daily and place there the abomination of desolation. All right. And Daniel 12, 11, once again. And from the time that the daily is taken away and the abomination of desolation is set up, there shall be 1,290 days. So the Bible states that the papacy received a host. 
is what it says in the old King James, but as mom just read the new King James, an army that they use to fight against Christ and take from him the daily. That's Christ's ministry in the heavenly sanctuary. So Clovis in AD 508, he pledged his arms, he pledged his army, his country to the service of the Bishop of Rome. For Rome to have this kind of loyalty, they offered him not only the title of Emperor of the Franks, but they called it the Roman Emperor. They offered him the title as new Roman Emperor. And the successors, one of which was Charlemagne, they established the Holy Roman Empire. But Clovis was very, very instrumental in binding his kingdom to that of the Catholic Church. And he did this by a series of laws known as the Saliac or Salient Laws that warned anyone who dared ignore them, beware on penalty of death. So in order to understand how important Clovis was to history, here's some quotes from a historian named Heidi Hikes in a book, 8508. That's the title of the book, 8508. So here's, here's the quotes. Bishops were the ones who had helped the king of the Franks to establish his power. It was through them and with them that he was governing. He knew it, and his deference to them was anterior to his conversion. Another quote says, beyond encouraging individual bishops to play a vital role in his kingdom, Clovis sought to use their collective presence as a force to shape a national church that would serve under royal direction to institute a common religious life throughout his realm. His entire religious policy played an important role in bringing the Christian establishment into support for the new regime. At around the same time, Clovis played an significant role in establishing a political and religious order, which provided a framework in which the Germanic and Roman worlds could join hands in shaping a new civilization in Europe. That's what, that's what the French were able to do. That was the start of that. You had the Roman world, you had the Germanic world. They were able to bring them together. What remained of the Roman world was the papacy. That's what survived. And these barbarian tribes, it was able to trick them. It was able to conquer them into uh, submission. And one of the first, in fact, the very first was Clovis. All right. Another quote, the Church of France was distinguished for many ages by its zeal for the independence and purity of ecclesiastical elections. Under the first and second Frankish dynasties, the church was the main source and principle of civilization, the dominant power of society. All important acts of legislation emanated from its councils. Its prelates were ministers of state. Its priests were civil magistrates. Justice was ordinarily dispensed through its tribunals. Church and state were in fact so ultimately blended as to be scarcely distinguishable the one from the other. See friends, that's what Clovis did. He made these laws. That's what France did. It, it became the defender of the papacy and through through his actions, he was able to convince the other kingdoms, most of the other kingdoms, to uh, make Catholicism the dominant religion in their lands also. So through the aid of these European powers, the papal system was able to create a false system of worship that it brought into the church, it, and the minds of the people were diverted from what should be where Christ was ministering for them instead to earth. And the whole idea, the whole biblical doctrine of the sanctuary was lost for over 1300 years until it was just rediscovered by the Advent movement. So now let's talk about the three powers that resisted. Okay, so we've talked about the beginning of the 1290. Let's talk about the 1260. Let's talk about the three powers that would not be swayed by the papacy. These were the Heruli, the Vandals, and the Ostrogoths. The Bible says that this little horn, the papacy, would pluck up all three by the roots. Now, the papacy knew 
that if it were to rise to power, it would have to break the power of these three kingdoms. So the Heruli were the first to fall. Remember 476 AD, they had deposed the Roman, they had brought the Roman Empire to, to an end. And the Heruli ruled in Rome. Well, in 490 AD, the Pope sent some emissaries to the Eastern Roman Emperor and convinced them to send the Ostrogoths to Italy to attack the Heruli. So he thought, well, if they destroy each other, I'm at an advantage. If one destroys the other, then I'll be done. And that's what happened is throughout a series of battles, the Ostrogoths were successful. And by the year 493 AD, there was no trace of the Heruli. They were exterminated from the face of the earth. Okay, the Ostrogoths did something, though, that the Bishop of Rome and the Catholic Church hated. They allowed freedom of religion. You see, they didn't like church and state to be united. They liked to leave people to choose their own religion, provided that they submitted to the authority of the state. So the next kingdom to go was the Vandals. And the, van, the emissaries of the Pope once again convinced the Eastern Roman Emperor Justinian to launch a religious war of genocide against the Vandals in Northern Africa. This war started in 534 AD, and after two years of fighting, the forces of Justinian annihilated the Vandals off the face of the earth by 536 AD. Just Belisarius then, the general, taking advantage of the fact that the Ostrogoths were not strongly united at this time. He sailed into Italy. He marched on and captured the city of Rome. In the spring of 537, the Ostrogoths marched. They laid siege to Rome. They actually thought they would force Justinian out of the city um, by cutting the water pipes. But remember, that's a Mediterranean country. And the water pouring on the ground, it bred mosquitoes, which attacked and devastated the Ostrogoth army to the point they broke the siege in 538 and fled north. Okay, and they banded together, the remnants of the Ostrogoths banded together with some other tribes that were left that were resisting. And for the next 15 years, they fought, they were successful at times, but they were eventually defeated once and for all in the year 553 AD, okay? The event that marked the beginning of the papacy's 1260 years of supremacy in 538 was the passage of a law at a council known as the Third Council of Orleans in, in France, in which the papal mark of authority was enforced by law. You can read about it, the Third Council of Orleans, so that was the beginning of the 1260 years, and it happened in 538, shortly after the Ostrogoth power was broken. So going back to the 1290 years, the, the Bible tells us that the abomination that makes desolate, the papacy, it had an army to fight against the people of God. The prophecy stated, though, that at the end of this time period, the same army would turn on and wound the papacy itself. This is what the Bible says in Revelation 13, verses 9 and 10. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. He who leads into captivity shall go into captivity. He who kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. So a lot of people think, well, that's referring to the captivity of the pope. No, friends, that's referring to the captivity of the papal system. The chains were put back on it. Um, it couldn't persecute and kill the people of God any longer with the sword. And then the killing that took place toward it was during the French Revolution that we're going to study very soon. Uh, but the, the Bible tells us, 1798, France, that same power that lent its army to the papacy 1290 years before in 508, that used that same arm, it used its armies to take the Pope prisoner, abolish the state power. And that was the end of it and any other country lending its armies to aid the papacy's war. 
So the 1290 years begin in 508 when Clovis, king of the Franks, converts to Catholic Christianity. He'd already done that, but in 508, he gave his country, his armies to the papacy to make war against God's people. And then in 1798, France reversed that policy. It attacked the papacy with its army. It wounded it. And it took away the ability to persecute God's people. That's the power of that state was taken away. And that's when the time of the end began. So I thought I would bring all of this together in a summary, uh, a summary that we, we've gone over in our whole study today. So I just want to bring these events to you. It'll be in your study again. Clovis converts, 508, pledges his armies, uh, and the papacy receives that army to fight against God and his people. For the next 1290 years, the abomination of desolation, the papacy destroys God's people with the assistance of the armies of France and the other nations of Europe. In 1798, which marks the end of the 1290 years and also the end of the 1260 years, France sends Alexander Berthier into Rome, Pope's taken prisoner, and beginning with France, all nations of Europe and eventually the world refused to aid the papacy in its wars against God and his people. The time of the end begins, friends. That's when the book of Daniel will be understood. That's when God's people rise up, the end time people who proclaim the three angels' message. And eventually among them, you find the remnant and eventually the 144,000 that we've studied. Okay, so that during the time of the end, God's people you will see the formation of God's end time people. Anyone who has, who keeps the commandments of God and has the testimony of Jesus. It's not about a church. It's about a people. Okay. In the near future, the nations of the world I want to point you forward in time. The nations of the world, once again, give their armies to the papacy. They, and that is when the time of the end will end. And the end of time begins the same time. Around the same time, the mark of the beast will be enforced by law, and the freedoms that we've enjoyed are going to be taken away. Okay, we have to, we have to appreciate them now, friends, because eventually those freedoms will be taken away. The mark of the beast will be legislated by law. The world will be plunged into a final period of time, the time of the end. The world will stand completely against the people of God, and only those who have a constant relationship with Jesus will survive the final crisis. The only thing that will get us through this final time of darkness will be our faith in God. It's easy to look at the times just ahead of us and say, well, they're scary, they're terrifying, they'll be very rough, and it's true. It's very true. But I don't want to end the study with fear. I want to end it with some things that should bring peace to you. This is what Jesus said. Jesus said, these things I have spoken to you, John 16, 33, that in me you might have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. My friends, this world is going to get rough. It's going to be like a ship tossed around on the ocean. We need to remember, though, that the same Jesus who calmed the winds and the rain is in the boat with us. So we got to not abandon the boat, my friends. We've got to stay in the boat because Jesus is the captain of that boat. He will guide it safely into shore. Today, as we close, there's two final passages of scripture that I want to share with you so you can understand how powerful God is. You know, there's a, many people in the world, billions of people today. If every one of them stood against you, you would still have more power on your side because this is what Romans 8.31 says. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Okay. It doesn't matter if the entire world stands against you. If God is on your side, 
You have more power with you than the entire world combined. Second passage of scripture, Jesus does not abandon us when we go through the crisis. Jesus said in Matthew 28, verse 20, and lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the world. Friends, and the world ends when Jesus returns. It doesn't end when the, when the mark of the beast is enforced. It doesn't end when the papacy regains its power. It doesn't end when people are being killed for standing for Jesus, just as they did during the dark ages of the past. It ends when Jesus comes again. Have you made Jesus your forever friend? The weakest soul that holds the hand of Jesus can resist the devil to the point that the devil will flee from them, just as he did Jesus after the three temptations. If you hold on to the hand of Christ, through the power of Christ, you can resist the devil and you can say, get thee behind me and he will run. My friends, the time of the end is soon to close and the end of time will come in and the devil will try to plunge the world into a final age of darkness. But this darkness will be broken by the second coming of Christ. My appeal to you today is simple. I have a question. And the question is this, what holds you back from a personal relationship with God? Is there something holding you back that would prevent you from going home with Jesus if he were to return right now? It's only something that you, you can answer. And it's just something between you and God. If there is something, it's time to give it all to Jesus. Don't hold it back. This is the appeal today. If God's shown you something that you need to lay down at his feet, in a moment, we're going to pray. We're going to pray silently uh, in the silence between you and God. Um, give it to God, okay? Give it up once and for all and do not take it back. You can say to it, whatever it is, that sin, that habit, whatever it is, you can say, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. Get thee behind me. Never come back. That's the appeal. Because it doesn't matter, friends. The tragedy would be to face death without Christ is a big tragedy. But also, if Jesus were to come in the clouds, whatever that little thing is for you to not be among those who go home with him. That's how, that's what the devil wants. Lay it down. Let Jesus have it. Let's bow our heads. Let's pray. Lord, history played out just as you said it would. Clovis rose up on the scene and he did exactly what was prophesied. And the papal power had that army, Lord. And for 1260 years, it used that army to scatter your people, but it did not destroy them completely. It shattered their power, but you had people. You raised up people, little lights in the darkness, Lord, the Luthers, the Calvins, the Wycliffs, the Husses. Lord, we are those people in our age just now. Father, there are souls that sit in darkness that need the light of truth. Right now in the time of the end, this is when your church is rising, your final people, those who have the commandments of God, who keep them, and they have the testimony, they have prophecy. Lord, we want to be among those people because the final crisis reveals them in their strength, and their strength is you. Soon, the armies of the world will give their power back and the dark ages will begin again. But it will not be another 1260 years, Lord. It will be short, intense, and it will be over. Father, my prayer is that we will lay all down at your feet. There's something that we've been holding back. We lay it down just now. We rebuke it in your name. And Lord, just like Moses said to the children of Israel, Whatever this is, whatever we've laid down, we will never see it again. Lord, let us walk forward in faith. 
and share while, the, while we live in the light because the times of darkness are soon to come. But just on the other side of that, it's time to be home with you. And we look forward to that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.